USC School of Cinematic Arts summer program and USC's director of the YouTube Creator Institute. And thank you so very much for joining us tonight, both to our audience here in Los Angeles at the School of Cinematic Arts and to all of you watching from around the world, welcome. Uh, before I begin, I would like to quickly acknowledge Dean Elizabeth Daly, Dean of the Film School, who has just today returned from overseas and <laughs> has joined us just to say hello. Um, I would like to talk for one brief moment about why we are doing this. Uh, essentially, YouTube and the School of Cinematic Arts believe in the same thing in creative content, that it doesn't matter what part of the world you're from, what equipment you are using, uh, it is about storytelling and it is about the creative process and that by joining us in these intimate evenings, you will be able to be inspired by some of the comments made and hopefully become greater storytellers and greater filmmakers, and that's what we're all looking for. So again, welcome. We're very fortunate tonight to have with us as a moderator, Justin Wilson, who is the head of alumni relations for USC. He is a graduate of the film school and MFA, and most importantly, just wrote and had shot his first film, which was shot, I believe, just in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And so I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good to my left is our guest of honor this evening, and we are fortunate indeed to have with us Melissa Rosenberg. She is unequivocally the most sought after and successful writer in the industry today, both in television and the big screen. You probably know her best on Dexter for the work that she has done both as the writer and as executive producer of Dexter and also of the mega hits, the Twilight series of films. There are many other credits, but I think those speak for themselves and you've heard enough from me. I would like to turn it over, if I may, to Justin and Melissa. Thank, thank you, you so much for My joining pleasure. us and joining the world this evening. <laughs> Thank you, and thanks to everyone for being here. Um, so Melissa, uh, David mentioned your, your credits. Uh, I know you've also had other jobs. You've been uh, a bartender, a legal secretary, a dancer, uh, but maybe you could talk a little bit about did any of those jobs ever prepare you for Twilight and the <laughs> incredible success that, and the attention that has come to you uh, with, with the series? Uh, you know, they've, they've uh, contributed in that uh, having lived a life outside of, of Hollywood, uh, uh, Hollywood, uh, having had a lot of different life experiences have uh, contributed to, to the stories that I, uh, can tell so uh, but you know t the success that I've have at this moment is very long in coming and and hard fought and so uh, I'm the longest overnight success you'll uh, you'll ever come across and you know so all of those those different experiences were uh, essential to what I do now so you know, we'll, we'll start with Twilight. I mean, was it something with, with the series, um, you've, now you've adapted all five of the movies that are gonna be made. Was it a conscious decision on your part that you wanted to, you know, be the kind of creative t caretaker as a screenwriter, or did it just sort of develop after the first one? It, it, um, it at one point it was a conscious decision. Um, the, one, two, and three sort of just came about, you know, and it all happened very, very quickly. Uh, the Twilight movies happen on almost a television schedule. They're, they're uh, because one, vampires don't age, so you, you better catch them while they're young. And two, we wanted to capture our audience uh, while we had them. Uh, so, so those happened very, very quickly. And then after three, I thought I was done, and I thought, well, I've done three. I'm, uh, you know, that certainly I've, I've uh, done what I'm going to contribute to this. But it, then it, it, I sort of anticipated handing it over to somebody else, and it, it's 
I, I, I wanted to see the, the series through. I wanted to see these characters through. I wanted to stay with their story. And as a, as a longtime television writer, that's what I love about tele television is the continuing storylines and, and really exploring every, uh, all of the different characters' potential stories. So ultimately, I, I wanted to see it all through. Mm. Now, the, the final two films are, are set to be uh, released in the next year, year and a half. Um, are, is, it, is it over for you? I mean, have you, have you done your last bit of work, or is there still anything left uh, for you in, in terms of... That remains to be seen. Yeah. We're, uh, they're in post now, editing it, and uh, our director, Bill Condon, uh, is, is uh, also a screenwriter. He's an Academy Award-winning screenwriter. So, um, you know, certainly if tweaks need to happen, it's in good hands. Um, and uh, Bill and I had a really tremendous creative relationship. So, uh, but, it, you know, I'll, I'll go back in and help him in any way I can and with any sort of ADR or, or anything that needs to go on. Right. So I know for, for a while you were kind of pulling double duty on Dexter as well as the Twilight movies doing, you know, you were in the writer's room and then you would go back and, and do the feature films. Uh, I, I know you at, at one point you, you stopped on Dexter. Um, is, that, is that your plan now? You want, do you want to go back and, and be able to do both or are you, are you happy on the, the feature route right now? Oh, no, I'll never yeah. give up television. I love television. It's, it's so, um, this really, one of my favorite places to be is in a writing room. It's also one of the most frustrating places to be is a writing room, uh, a television writing room on, on television series. Uh, you have a staff of writers and you sit in a room and bang your heads against the wall together and, and come up with a story for a season. As a feature writer, you do that all by yourself, and it's not nowhere near as fun. Uh, so uh, I, I love that collaborative process, and I also love the immediacy of television. And again, I love the, the continuing storytelling of television as well. So I uh, will continue to do both as long as they'll let me. So. Now it was announced, I think at one point you were going to do um, a, uh, a female superhero TV show. Is that, can you tell us about that, what's happening? It's, um, it's not a go yet. It may, it may never go, uh, but it, is, um, it was based on a Marvel comic called, the comic was called Alias, and for obvious reasons the series will not be called Alias, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, a tremendous graphic novel by a guy named Michael, anyone who knows comic books knows Brian Michael Bendis, and uh, this, this character was just so, I, what, when, I, when I came off of all the Twilight stuff, I would go around and met, uh, meet people and they asked, well, what do you want to do next? And I, all I knew was what I'd really love to do is I'd love to do a, a graph, uh, adapt a, a graphic novel. I'd love to do a really kick-ass female, super flawed, damaged character. And, uh, and, you know, that's what I want to do. And, and sure enough, ABC came up with this comic book from Marvel, which I had never heard of, and, and uh, it was exactly right. So, uh, you know, I, I got to write it, and if it, if it, it never sees the light of day, at least I actually got the chance to uh, put it on, the pa on page. Uh, we'll see if, it, if something comes of it. But that is exactly the kind of thing I would love to continue to do. Okay. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about how you got started as a writer. Um, uh, I know you, you were a graduate of the Peter Stark program, but prior to that, you, you were a dancer and a choreographer. Um, can you talk, and I know it, it, uh, it, a couple times I've read you, you know, likened writing to choreographing on the page. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that, is that uh, are there any, any ways that it's uh, also analogous other than, you know, you're, you're choreographing, you know, the, the rhythm of scenes? Maybe you could just talk a bit, little bit about sure. that. Uh, yes, I was, it was in undergraduate at Bennington that I uh, was studying dance and, and wanted to become a, a choreographer. And uh, the kind of choreography I loved and still love to watch as an artist is, is the, the kind of dance that tells a story. And so that was the kind of thing I, was, I worked on a lot. And uh, so and, and you're telling a story with movement, with time and space. And so it really was the beginning of my training of, of how to tell a visual story. Uh, so it served me in, in so many ways, uh, not the least of which was my very first job that I ever got, a movie for Paramount uh, that never got made and, and shouldn't go. <laughs> it was my first job, but it uh, was a dance movie. And one of the reasons I got that job was because of my background as a dancer. So it, it served me in a lot of different ways. Mm. 
So what was the decision for you to, to apply to Peter Stark and, and you know, why that program? Um, did you know you wanted to be a writer or were you mm. interested in producing as well? Yeah, by the time I, uh, I got out of uh, undergraduate and uh, be discovered that uh, screenwriting was actually something that one did for a living, I, I didn't understand that this was a job. Uh, stories on the screen, actually, somebody paid them to do that, and uh, quickly discovered that I want that was a, my ideal job. Uh, what I also discovered very quickly, because I began to work in in the industry, was how badly writers are treated. Um, it's and so I and I knew a lot of writers will will um, become directors to protect their work. Uh, I am probably one of the few writers in town who, who actually has no desire to direct. Uh, so I w actually came hit upon becoming a producer as a way of protecting my work or having bringing just a little more clout to my um, to my writing uh, to who I was as a writer. So uh, I found this Stark uh, the Stark pro pro program, the Peter Stark program for producing, and um, applied. I think I was I think the only writer in that group. It, it, it graduates twenty five people a year, and for some strange reason they let me in and. Uh, it, it was, you know, it was great. What do you remember about, you know, your time in, in Star classmates or professors or courses you took? What stands um, out? Some of my, uh, the, my, actually, one of my very best friends is, is a, was a fellow graduate with me. Um, and it's, um, it, what was probably one of the most important things about it was that all those people who I was in that program with, you know, a, a huge percentage of them went off and are now, uh, you, you know, in the executive ranks and producing ranks of, of town. So it was one of them who actually first got me one of, uh, one of my first agents. You know, these are relationships that, that help. And still, I come across Starkies in the strangest places. I was just working one for, for four years at uh, Showtime. Bob Greenblatt, who now has how, now heads up uh, NBC, he was the head of Showtime with, with Dexter. And uh, there's another pr uh, producer over at Summit Entertainment who does all the Twilight movies, and Jillian Bohr, also a, uh, a Starkey. And you just you you come across them in the strangest places, and we're all a very odd breed. You know, I was a dancer. How does that make me? It was, you know, it, they collected a, 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 and I assume continue to collect a very unusual mix of people. And that's what it that's what it takes. And and I think in storytelling is people bring different stories to the the table uh, in filmmaking. So. When, when you're, okay, so you're getting ready to graduate from Stark, um, what, what was your thought process as far as, okay, you know, I'm going to write specs, I'm going to, you know, try to be a writer, you know, what, 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 I guess the real question is, what was your, you know, first day job coming out of Stark? What did you do to sustain yourself coming <laughs> out of school? The very first thing I did after I got my MFA was go to bartending school. <laughs> so I got, I have a degree in mixology. Um, unfortunately, what I figured out very quickly is you can't get a job as a bartender. They are incredibly lucrative, lucrative jobs. No one would hire me uh, except for this mob money laundering front in which no one actually ever paid for a drink. So it was a, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I was, so it was a... Uh, Did they tip you at least? Well, no. when they would have these big parties, and I, I, I'm probably going to get like my knees bashed in. Uh, <laughs> you know, they had these big parties and, and no one would pay for a drink and someone would get like a club soda and hand me a 50, you know. Those, those didn't happen a lot, unfortunately, though. So <laughs> it was hard to make a living. But it was, uh, that was an extremely unique uh, experience. And uh, yeah, so bartending and then I became an um, a assistant to a lawyer, I was a, a legal assistant and... You know, I've had a lot of different jobs coming up, but it was just about specking material, continuing to write, continuing to write, study writing. I, I continued out of graduate school to study uh, at various different competing uh, institutions, which I shall not <laughs> name. Um, but uh, you know, I think any any and all information coming in is valuable, and uh, and and also those relationships that you make in all those those uh, places are essential because this is a an industry of relationships and uh, I, I would not be where I am now if I did not have uh, the relationships that I have. So talk about you know your first uh, your first agent your first writing gig what what were they? Um, uh, my first agent I've told this story here at USC before so some of you may have already heard it uh, my first agent came to me I'd written a spec and I had uh, went to a producer, uh, Liz Glosser, who was at Castle, Castle Rock at the time. And she, uh, she also had graduated Bennington and Peter Stark, which was 
unusual, uh, you know, the four of us who, you know, who'd done this. And uh, I brought her a script and she said, you know, this is great, this is great. We're not gonna make it, but I'm gonna help you get an agent. So then it went to her, then she got very busy and she handed it off to her assistant. And the assistant said, this is really great. I know we're not gonna make it, but let me help you get an agent. So she sent it to another producer. The producer said, this is really great. We're not gonna make it, but let me help you get an agent. <laughs> so then finally, she sent it out to her, her four favorite boutique agencies and said, we'll call them and get them the script. So I called them and I say, my, you know, I, she gave you the script and they're like, get me that script, get it to me right away. I'm like, God, what, what did she tell them? And one of them even wants to meet with me before they read the script. I have no idea, you know, wow, she, she was a hell of a saleswoman, this woman. So I go to this meeting, uh, uh, it was the Swan Agency, which is no longer in business, but uh, and I was at the agency, and the heads of the agency were in there pitching me and saying how much I should, why I should sign with their agency. And, and then one of them says, you know, but we just made a deal with your mother. And I'm thinking, God, these guys are good. She's been dead for 10 years. <laughs> so <laughs> this is when I realized that they think I'm Joan Rivers' daughter. Because Joan Rivers' daughter at the time was Melissa Rosenberg. Her father is Ed Rosenberg. And so she's now Melissa Rivers. But <laughs> so, uh, and, and so I had, of course, race back and call all these other people. And I, somewhere along the line, Liz knew I wasn't Joan's daughter, but it, somewhere along the line of telephone, you know, it got confused. <laughs> And so I had to go back, and fortunately, they had already read me and were too embarrassed to, you know, re ignore me now. So it, th then I was able to sign with one, and it kind of went like this. <laughs> but, uh, you so know. So if the writing it never works out, you have the red carpet to, to oh, walk Oh, absolutely. In. <laughs> I uh, have a lot of opinions about fashion. <laughs> but, uh, yes, yeah, so a benefit from nepotism without being related to anybody <laughs> in the industry. So. How, many, how many scripts, do you, if you remember, how many scripts had you written before that first gig? I mean, spec or otherwise? Hard to say. Um, I'd written uh, a couple of features, and um, then I started specking hour-long um, uh, episodes of hour-long television. The first gig, I hadn't really specked that many. I mean, she really, the, the woman who hired me over at Paramount really kind of took a flyer on me. Mm. Uh, and then I got my first gig as a, uh, on a staff at a show called, uh, long defunct, called Class of 96. And uh, that was my first television gig. Mm. Uh, so, you know, these guys initially, they, they took a flyer on me, but I didn't have a lot under my belt. Mm -hmm. Things have changed now. <laughs> a little tougher, perhaps, uh, to get in, or else I just got incredibly, uh, and I got incredibly lucky. I mean, that's interesting. I mean, thinking about, you know, now, like, if you were graduating from the Stark program today versus, you know, when you did, I mean, what, what do you think you might do differently now? I mean, in terms of preparing yourself or, you know, having a portfolio of material, Can you, I mean. Well, I know that I would, I think it's still, uh, I think, a, a wise idea to, I think one must continue to write no matter what. And I've done it throughout my career when, you know, any career has its ups and downs, perhaps not as wildly up and down as mine, but uh, y you know, the, the great thing about being a writer is that we can write ourselves out of uh, a low point. And that's, we're, unlike an actor or a director, you can't just go and start acting. I mean, you have to have a, 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 someone has to hire you or you know, at least put you in front of a camera. With us, we can sit down in our little hobbles and actually write ourselves out. Uh, and I've done that a number of times and, uh, and prepared to do it again, uh, should it come to it. And so, you know, the, the, just the process of writing, I, I, you, you get better with every script you write, or I get better with every script I've written, and, and uh, I continue to. I continue to learn things from every page that I produce. So I, I like to think, I God hope that I'm a better writer than I was a year ago and 10 years ago. Um, so I think it, uh, that, that remains tr true now that one must just continue to write and to learn and to study and to get feedback, constant feedback. Now I know you've been in a, you're still in a writer's group, right? Oh, I've, I've had a writer's group for 20 years, mm. tw going, yeah, going on 21. Uh, a group of us met in a uh, class given by another institution whose name we shall not mention. <laughs> uh, and uh, we just bonded together and we actually began to study with that instructor outside of the class. And then he left town and we continued on ourselves. And in one form, I'm not, I think there's only two of us are, are, who were orig originally there, uh, but we continue to meet. Uh, we, we have about eight or nine people uh, once a week and we have done so for 20 years with wow. rotating members coming in and out and varying degrees of, you know, I mean, people go on movies and they're gone for six months or go on television, television shows, they're gone for two years. 
you know, people rotate in and out. Hmm. So, you know, get, you know, coming back to your, you know, making your way through through uh, the industry, I mean, there's a lot of crossover now, obviously, films and television. Was there as much um, when you were starting? I mean, did, what, were they parallel tracks? In other words, you really, you have to write a, you know, your, your feature spec isn't necessarily going to get you a, a, a staff gig. I mean, did you have to just basically have uh, those two tracks and just continue to write in both medium? Yeah, it was a lot more divided when I first started uh, up until very recently. Um, you know, I think, I think, I think what started to happen is, and here's my little theory, uh, I think what started to happen is that it became harder and harder for movies to get made and more and more feature writers were discovering you could actually make something of a steady living in television. So they started coming over and a lot of pilots, you know, and they were, they were very sexy to studio executives as well because, you know, they've got movies and these are original creative voices to create uh, pilots. And in many cases that was very, it was very true. Uh, not that television writers didn't also have that, but the movie writers had actual examples of it. And so uh, they begin to crowd out, I think, a lot of television writers for things like pilots. And so then it started kind of going in the reverse, where television writers started going over on, uh, on into features. And uh, it became, for studio executives, I think stu they, they well, we, we're faster. I mean, <laughs> television writers, we're used to just pumping it out there, man. We can, we can write fast. We can, we know, uh, we're forced to do, um, to really work collaboratively. We, do, we deal with notes all the time from producers, from studio executives, from network executives. We're very, uh, very adept at dealing with notes. Um, and so studio, uh, the movie studio executives, I think, are a little surprised sometimes uh, by, oh, you actually addressed our notes. I was like, well, yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, it's the ones that uh, they they worked, and and uh, I I guess that isn't always the case. But there's there's so much crossover now going back and forth um, that I, I the we're all becoming very facile at at uh, you know both in both arenas. Mm. So on the 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 TV side, what was the was it a, was it a spec? Uh, hour long that you wrote that got you your first staff gig? Is that no, actually yeah. it was the feature I did for oh. Paramount. Okay. Oh no, it was the spec that I did for Paramount that got me the, the Paramount movie. That same spec is what got me. Hmm. Oh, was it? Hmm. No, you know what? It was also, I, I had specced a, a Picket Fences. Hmm. That's right, I specced a Picket pe Fences. And that was, that plus the feature is what got me my first, hmm. first gig. So you know, there's as every as you may or may not know, there's a there's a kind of hierarchy in in terms of you know television with staff writers and story editors, you know, supervising executive, co-executive, executives, and so on. Did you was it a conscious um, idea in your mind that that you wanted to, you know, become a showrunner and and were there steps that you took to try to you know to to get to that point? I tried not to get fired. <laughs> Uh, was not actually successful often at that, but uh, uh, it was, yeah, it was really about just learning everything I could every step of the way, and I very, very slowly climbed my way up, and uh, so it was, it's been a, a very long process, but, um, you know, I don't, I don't know that if it had come about any sooner than now that I would uh, have known what I was doing. I'm a slow learner, so it just took me a while, uh, but I've learned a great deal from those around me. Mm. And so hopefully it will go more smoothly when I uh, have my own show. Mm. Well, well, that remains to be seen, by the way. <laughs> so you were, you, you know, you, you were on a number of shows. I mean, do you think that, uh, you know, to get to that point where you're running uh, the writer's room on Dexter, right. did, did all of those different experiences serve you better than if you maybe you just stayed on one show and, you know, just stayed with it to try to, I mean, looking back, I mean. I don't, I, I don't know if that's necessarily, you know, it depends on the show. I have a lot of, um, there are many friends who would get on, you know, the first year of Buffy and they're there for seven years. And I'm like, why don't, why can't I have that career? You know, why couldn't I have, you know, or, or they're on Six Feet Under for five years and then they come to Dexter for five years. It's like, you know, really, my career was, you know, one show, one show, this one got canceled, I got fired off that. This one is, you know, finally, you know, got canceled after that. It just... It was one, one season, one show for me for 10, 10 years. And it was a combination of, of luck that just, you know, whatever show I was on just didn't make it for one reason or another, or it was a combination of my 
not clicking right with the showrunner, and that's always a crapshoot because you know that kind that relationship is a very is like a, a, an arranged marriage. You go and you sit with somebody for you know half an hour, and they talk to you and decide whether or not they want to sit in a room with you, you know, more than they sit with their spouse uh, in the, over the entire course of a marriage, and it's it's a really intense environment. And it's hit or miss whether or not you, it's going to work out. And um, it didn't always work out for me. And so, the, you know, that was, that was a blow. And sometimes it worked out beautifully. And it was like, well, this is the last year of the show. And it just, you know, was, I forget what your original question was. But no. <laughs> sort of Getting, be, be, becoming the showrunner on Dexter. I mean, maybe oh, yeah. you talk a little, bit, a little bit about that, how that came about. Well, that was, you know, it's interesting. Part of it was just being in so many different writing rooms and knowing how I like to work. Um, you know, not every television show has a writing room. Some, write, some, some shows just don't work like that. Like, for instance, uh, Law & Order. I don't think Law & Order has ever had a, a writing room. Law & Order is also, um, they do a lot of standalone episodes. So I don't know if they were a serialized show, if they had continuing storylines, whether or not they would... Um, whether or not they would have a room or not, but that's just not the way they work, was, which is perfectly legitimate. It took me a while to figure out that I, that, that I am definitely a writing room kind of person. This is why I love television, is because I love that writing room and I love that creative back and forth. So uh, it took me a while to figure out that it, I should not go on shows that don't have writing rooms. It's just not, my, it's not how I work. So figuring that out was important. And... Um, you know, just kind of figuring out through trial and error how I like to break stories. Uh, and then it just sort of, the combination of having accrued enough information coupled with the project of Dexter, which just kind of s sank up with my voice in, in a way that kind of was right for me and I guess right for the show. And, uh, and the, the showrunner, Clyde Phillips, the way we work our rhythms together, we have a very similar work ethic and um, a very similar respect for one another uh, and to, you know, staying out of each other's way to let each other do what we do. And um, it just sort of, you know, and the show was successful. That's what you need. You need to be able to get along with the, you know, with the people who keep you working. You need to be good at what you do and you also need to have the show be success. It's like they're not always coming together at the same time. So. Is it is it that different in in the sense of you know like in, in Dexter you're I mean you're you're there, there's someone else be it a, the you know the the original source material or the the you know the EP someone else's vision that you're kind of executing is it um, I mean was it was it difficult for you or did is it something you just adapt to and learn you know throughout the years about how to do it I think you just learn I mean so I think some people you know, get it right away. Some people right out of the gate have, um, just kind of get it. Uh, I, I don't think that's common. Uh, I think most people, there is a, a it is a craft, um, and you have to know how to, you, you learn the craft of actually constructing story and constructing scenes and constructing seasons. Uh, you, there's also, uh, a, the craft of being in the writing room. The, the trickiest part, I think, of television writing is the politics. It is a very political situation, um, not uh, in a necessarily in a bad way. It's just um, you're, you're, you're in a room with people. You're working very closely with people, and at one point or another, you're going to hate virtually everyone in that room. You're absolutely you, the worst of who you are and the worst of who they are will come out at one point or another. And you have to be able to uh, roll with that. You have to be able to um, forgive it and move on. You have to be able to come back from it if it's you. Uh, it's it's a it's just a really in, in terms of just interpersonal politics, it's it's a minefield, and so I think some people are more adept at dealing with that than others. I think I really had to learn how to deal with that, and I I think uh, I really got just I'm not sure I ever learned how to do it. I think I just got in control of it. So <laughs> <laughs> I mean I don't know that I'm 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 not the most politically savvy person uh, in in the world, and you know there's only so much that, that one can be taught. You know. We'll talk. About, I mean, you, you mentioned the the project, your, your you know your own project now for ABC, and and obviously Dexter uh, was on cable. You've worked you know on shows that are cable, pay cable, network. I mean, talk about the differences, and you know, do you have a preference? Well, you know, uh, when I Dexter was the last thing I uh, staff I had been on, and when I was on that, I said, man, I'm never going back to network because it was just 
such a, uh, you know, first of all, you're doing a much smaller order of episodes. You're doing 12 episodes as opposed to 22. 22 episodes is a ridiculous amount of, of storytelling to try to do in one year. I mean, and you're doing it under such an intense time pressure that the, 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 that the shows that are really good, high quality shows on network television, it's a miracle that they, I, I don't know, I mean, a show like The Good Wife or House, these are beautifully written shows. I don't know how uh, in 22 episodes. It's it's uh, it's really it's not a system that's set up to uh, bring out the, the to uh, you know nurture the best uh, uh, of our abilities. Um, so I'm a hats off to to those who have been successful at it. I mean at, at Dexter, um, I'm not you know we're certainly we were a, a very talented group of writers. But you know when you're doing 12, you actually have time to make it good. I mean I think time equals quality. And uh, so it's less of a mystery how the, those, how the great shows of cable are, are as great as they are. We have the time to mm. make them great. Mm -hmm. um, so I was never going to go back to network, unfortunately, or, or fortunately for me. You know, ABC came up with, was the one who came up with the, the, the property. And, uh, you know, I, I go back warily, but uh, so far they are, uh, have been actually been a really great creative experience. Again, it, it may come to nothing, so, you know. I'll talk to me in a year, and I'll be like, ah, screw them. <laughs> <laughs> so for our students and, and alums and you know, those watching, I mean, if, if you're looking at it uh, now from the standpoint of, okay, what do you recommend uh, for becoming a television writer? Um, do you still recommend the, you know, writing a, a, a spec for the kind of show you want to be on or an original pilot or a feature? All three. Or, all three. Um, really all three. I think, I think for me personally, uh, if I'm hiring writers, I want to re read an original work, um, preferably a pilot, I would say, to see if you can write in, uh, in that format um, and, and tell a story in that period of time. Um, but I think it's also valuable, I important to have a, a, a spec that tells uh, a showrunner that you, know, you can adapt to someone else's voice, you know, that you, if you are going to write a house, that you can match the voice because that is what your job will be as a television writer is to, uh, to, you know, help the showrunner realize his or her uh, vision, and that doesn't mean going off and doing your, you know, whatever your it's your version of the show is. You know, you have to show that you can do theirs. So it, I think having all three is, uh, or certainly at least a, a, a spec episode and a spec pilot is is a good or. Or episode in a feature, you know, this is uh, important. But you should just always be writing and always be producing more material because you may think you have the best spec in the world. It's not. Uh, you th the next one you do is going to be better, and the one after that is going to be better, and you're always going to you, you better. You should hope that it's going to be better. Uh, so it, I think that's you know essential. Well, I have more questions, but we you know this is uh, YouTube. We we do have some questions from around the globe. So I'm going to ask you some from our our. Uh, satellite uh, offices so okay uh, it's a YouTube question okay so using copyrighted content to create derivative work is a big issue in the industry sometimes it can be amazing but other times it violates rights Twilight deals with this a lot online you've got spoofs of the films music videos etc do you see these works as positive or negative and how so that comes from Selena in Milan Italy you know I, I love them. I think they're fantastic, and and you know anything that inspires someone, even if it's coming from a place of ah, oh, that's a piece of shit, you know, to to make something to spoof it is is, uh, you know, I find it really uh, entertaining and whatever you know whatever inspires someone. Where I where I have a, a, a huge problem is uh, when people are uh, pirating stuff. Uh, that is. Uh, I, I take personal issue with that because that's money out of my pocket, a lot of serious money. That's a lot of serious money out of the pockets of the crews and the people who actually make the movies. Um, so uh, that is a, a personal, uh, very personal issue to me. So do not pirate wherever you are. And also, um, you know, the issues of copyrighted material of, of you know, Stephanie Meyer, who wrote these books, has had material uh, stolen and has you know or, or released online before it was ready. People have you know taken uh, footage from our from Breaking Dawn that is you know not been cut at all and putting it online. 
you know, I find that really, first of all, why? You know, why not wait for, why would you, it's not, that's, I, I don't get it, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> I mean, why not just wait for the story to be told? You know, it's going to be much more interesting than whatever crappy outtake you lifted off the web. So I don't know. I don't get that. But, um, but you know, she's she's refusing now to, to uh, release certain things uh, sto and sto doesn't want to even tell stories in certain ways because people are are you know putting them out there before she's ready. And I, I find that uh, just an enormous violation. Hmm. Okay. Um, okay, Billy from Boulder, Colorado. Uh, what sorts of challenges do you face between the author, studio, and fan community when adapting such an adored series like Twilight? Oh, my God. It can be, uh, talk about minefields. Um, but, you know, the fans were, uh, they, there are no fans like um, uh, teenage girls. There are, they, <laughs> um, and they are the best. Let me tell you, they will, they will, they have very passionate feelings. And they will go see this movie ten times, even if they hate it, just to prove that it was bad the second time around. They will get the the DVDs, and they will. I mean, they are avid fans, and I love their passion. I mean, trust me, they are just like they are the fans. Uh, what you get with that kind of passion is also passionate hatred sometimes, and you have to deal with that. I mean, you know, it's you get the. Uh, you know, the person who said your hands should be chopped off and you should be gutted. And, you know, it's you know, no one likes to hear that. <laughs> it's terrible. But um, you know, they they've also made this what it is. You know, they've made and it, I'm sorry, it's not just teenage girls. It's all it's sort of women in general uh, uh, have uh, been our audience, and um, we're passionate. Those girls, we we are all or nothing. So I, you know, I'm. Thank you for the for buying the tickets, even if you hated it. Well, I, I think I think we have a few fans on here. So Sia, I think that's pronounced Sia, asks. I've heard that the Breaking Dawn script was different from the other three Twilight movies. How so? And did Bill Condon have any say with the script? Oh, absolutely, Bill did. Um, it was it was different in that uh, the first three stories are the stories of, of teenagers. Uh, they're high school stories in some ways. I mean, they're you know they're still in high school. The Breaking Dawn, the book, was a departure for Stephanie from the first three books, and so hence the movie is as well. It's, an, it's a, actually a pretty adult story. It's a story of uh, you know, a marriage, of parenthood, of leaving home, of growing up. I mean, it's, it's, so it's, it's, a very, it's a different animal. It's a different um, uh, you know, arena. And regarding Bill Condon, I mean, who wouldn't want Bill Condon to have his input on a script? I mean, this is a, a, a masterful storyteller, so, um, first of all. But secondly, he also, and I say this uh, really sincere, sincerely, one of the loveliest people, and I'd heard that from about 10 other sources before I actually met with him. So that was, um, that is, I guess, common knowledge in, the ta in, in town. But um, I went, by the time I had gotten to Breaking Dawn, I was, you know, I was, Tired, and I was I was dragging I was dragging ass a little bit on like oh my god Bella one more time you know, just like, I mean I was losing <laughs> you know I was losing drive and um, you know one thing you'll never hear a screenwriter say or rarely hear a screenwriter say is to the director is aren't you sure you you don't want to take a pass on this aren't you, you sure you don't want to rewrite this you know you never hear that but I was actually like I kept on saying to Bill surely Bill you want to put your stamp on it don't you want to just take a pass come on please you know? <laughs> and he he really he did not want to write this he did not you know uh, that he was very clear about that um, so that said we went through I mean it started with my doing the outlines and breaking the story in general and then him you know getting my getting feedback from him and all from also from the studio and Stephanie always uh, and then as we got closer and closer to what the scripts were going to be, he and I would sit down. We went by scene by scene. We went through every line and every scene until it was, um, until we were both happy with it, until it was what he wanted to shoot. Mm. So there, I, I don't know that there was a great deal of rewriting going on because we worked so intensively to get the scripts where the, to be the stories that we wanted to tell and that he wanted to tell. So uh, it was a very close collaboration. And I, uh, talk about, uh, you know, he really brought my game up. I mean, it was, you know, after a 20-year career, it's always a, a wonderful thing to be pushed even further, and uh, he, he did that. Great. Well, we have more questions, but your turn. Anyone who wants to raise their hand, we'll uh, 
Do we have a mic, David? That's a really good question. Um, you know, in TB, you're happy uh, if it's 80%, if you get 80% of it. That's like a huge, to me, that's, you know, a huge success. Because you're moving so fast in TV that, that uh, the production or director could actually get exactly everything the way you want it. And you don't have to kind of budget. Um, in the features, um, that's been a, uh, it's been, it's been, you know, kind of a little bit of, the, the, the thing that you come to, or the thing that I had to come to is, you know, by the time I finish the screenplay, I've seen the movie in my head. I've seen a very, you know, I know exactly what it is in my head. It's n obviously never going to be that on the screen because there's now a hundred other people that are kind of come in and put their, what they see in their head, and it's going to become a collaborative. What ultimately ends up on the screen is either, you know, is this a combination with the director and the studio and myself and everyone else who collaborates, the actors. Uh, so there's always a period of time for me of just, of, of first going, oh, being disappointed. Because it's not what the movie in my head, which the movie in my head, by the way, costs about a billion dollars. So, <laughs> yeah. So I, I first have to kind of go through that process. And then it's, it's sort of looking at it fresh and going, okay, well, that was, it's not the same. It's different. But, you know, that's, uh, uh, but it's as good. And, uh, and I'm really happy when I go, wow, that was better, you know. Um, but I have a bit of an ego, so it's not often better. So <laughs> 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 but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting process to really let go of, of that. And uh, it's been an exercise. Hi, thank you, thank you again for coming. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Billy, and um, I was wondering what is the biggest thing missing in your eyes that's missing in Hollywood right now, and what you, how would you like to see us, all us uh, up and coming filmmakers, fill that void? Oh, that's it, women. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, you know, you can help with that. Um, it's. Um, you know, it's there. There's uh, the studies. Studies come out every year, and one just recently came out in which uh, women. Uh, I think I, I don't remember the numbers, but they're horrible. They are lower. The number of women who are working in Hollywood is lower than they were ten years ago. Um, we huh. represent. Uh, I don't know. We're, we're I think 28 percent of the writers guild are women. Uh, my numbers are probably off, but I think only 12 or 13 percent of working writers are, are women. Directors is seven percent or something like that. Um, the roles for women, the, the characters for women, this is Billy where you can help out here. Um, you know, it's, it, it's a, it's sort of a, a given that, and I'm sorry, man, I don't mean to, you know, I'm not, I'm not bashing on you at all. Uh, but it's a, it's a sort of a given that, uh, a white man can write a, an ethnic character, a female character or, or a white male character. It's a, but it is also a given that an, uh, an ethnic writer can only write that their ethnicity and a female character can only write women. So it's, a, it's an odd, I, I don't quite know where that, uh, yeah. that rule came around, but um, it's, uh, it limits us. And that's why um, minorities and women are just horribly underrepresented in, in, uh, on, from all, in all aspects of our industry. So, um, that, and that is, uh, the storytelling, I think, is that it, it limits what we see. It limits the, uh, the stories that are told out there. And... Um, I, I think it, it, it hurts creativity. So I, uh, what I want to see more is I want to see more women going to film school, more women writing, more women directing, and it, that is up to us. I mean, that is get a fucking spine and get out there because you're going to get, really, I mean, it, you know, it's hard. It's really hard. And we just have to be prepared to take some hits. And I, and I don't, you know, so I would say men, you know, reach out beyond your world and I'd say women get a spine and go out there because your voice is needed. Your voice is needed. 
your voice is needed. And I think the, the uh, and someone, I don't know if Elizabeth's here, but the current uh, or incoming uh, production class, I think is for the first time 50-50 male, female here. So <laughs> yay for that. So. Good. Um, that's great. So you know, we, every little bit helps. That's, a, that's really significant. Can we hear uh, from our institute uh, participants, please? Question? We can repeat it. So what's a mark that you think every writer should always have in their portfolio? How do you battle yeah. rejection? <laughs> oh, <laughs> if rejection from the, from the outside. Yeah, that's, is that a tough one? Because, you know, it, it is the life of a screenwriter. It's the life of, you know, anyone in Hollywood, really. But, you know, it's really, you, you it's, um, there's a lot of rejection in our business, and uh, it's it's. Uh, I, I think what it takes is a uh, what I call delusional optimism. So that when you're you know down there lying on the floor bleeding, you say, okay, well maybe tomorrow it'll get better, you know, and I, I guarantee you it won't, but the day <laughs> after it will, and you just kind of keep picking yourself up with this idea that it's going to get better, and it eventually does. I mean, I know that sounds kind of you know. Um, silly but it's it really just takes that just convincing yourself that it's going to, uh, you know and it, optimism but in the face of uh, you know you, you I mean you really have to kind of uh, be inventive in your mind because it's it's optimism in the face of, of a lot of cruelty and a lot of um, disappointment and personal rejection and you know it's it's but you know, we're all, I think part of why we're all uh, creators and we all, are, uh, you know, are uh, imaginers, uh, imaginers, that's a word, um, is that we think creatively. We come up, so just the, tell yourself the story of how you're going to, you know, the day after tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to just live in this fantasy world to a certain extent. Uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, fortunately, that's what we do as, as filmmakers is we live in a fantasy world. Uh, I don't know if that helps much, but... <laughs> Can we see some hands and some? I know several of you. There we are on that side. Thank you, Ty. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, thank you for coming out. Um, <coughs> do you ever do anything with the scripts that you write that are turned down? You know, they're sitting on a shelf. Um, every once in a while, I've been known to kind of go back and look at one and go, "Oh, I could kind of fix this up." But you know what? I just con I just move forward. Um, it's to me move, going backward is you know there are more stories to tell and I just have a tendency to just keep keep going forward and looking for new stories to tell so that's just me I know a lot of people who you know have that gem sitting in their uh, in their drawer and uh, you know certainly they should stay with it. Hi. Yep. Hi, um, thank you. It's been very inspiring so far. And just um, to just to piggyback off of what you were saying, we have um, as uh, alumni of USC, we have a Women's Cinematic Arts listserv. I don't know if you know about that. It was recently started a few years ago, and I didn't know. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that came out on our, we had an online discussion about bridesmaids and how it's a female buddy comedy, and it's the the opening box office um, was. Uh, unpredictably high and it's sort of now making a case for female buddy comedies and I just think that it's, it's interesting how female led movies need to like prove themselves over and over again like with Twilight it was such an overwhelming success it, there, it's so obvious that there's a market but why do female driven movies need to prove themselves again and again and again so that was it, kind it, of it's a, it's, a, it's a very good point um, it's funny. It's it's uh, it, it doesn't just apply to female movies. Certainly, it, do, it 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 includes female movies, but uh, or fe female you know, female driven movies, uh, uh, audience movies. Uh, uh, yes, it's true. Twilight was in the same situation of, oh my God, girls are going out to see the movie. They're they're seeing it again and again. It's like, yeah, because uh, shockingly, women and girls will go see movies if you tell stories they they want to see. Um, Bridesmaids is a little bit different in that the audience, I think, skews probably both male and female. Bridesmaids is such a great, very funny movie. Oh, God. Um, but it's not just true of women's movies. I mean, it's also, 
when you think about it, you know, I mean, I remember when I, I wrote um, Step Up, which was also shot in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. My first movie was in Baltimore mm -hmm. as well. It's a great town. Uh, it's a great town for shooting, yeah. yeah. And um, it was, uh, you know, it had done fairly well for, for its size. And it was, oh, my God, dance movies are... are are you know this big thing and it's, you know dance movies have been a big thing since the 30s and 40s or even before that it's just when you make a good dance movie i mean i don't know the step up you know i mean i, I don't want to turn, toot my own horn but uh, i mean it was you know it was an entertaining movie movie and you know when you make a movie like you know uh, well i'm not going to name names but there are some bad mu musicals out there there's some bad dance movies out there and so you put out a bad dance movie and suddenly they go oh dance movies are dead everyone hates dance movies <laughs> You know, I mean, and that's just all the time that happens. You know, I mean, you know, high, oh, every bad high school movie comes out. Oh, teenagers, high, high school movies are dead. No, if you do a good one, you know. So, I, I mean, it's just marketing, chasing marketing and trying to, everybody, you know, wants to know the answer. And it, 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 the answer is always the same to me. Tell a good story. If it's not a good story, it's, you know, that is, and that's, you know, because that's, that's not easy, telling a good story and judging what a good story is and making that story into a good movie. It's, it's so, you know, nebulous and hard to, you know, calculate that uh, they come up with all these other things. And so, you know, I think the female-driven movies uh, fall, prey, fall prey to that as well. So you mentioned, I, I wanted to ask you about um, locations because, I mean, on the, the movie I, that I just finished, it was a script written about Baltimore, but once uh, I went and spent a lot of time there, it really changed in terms of just the feel and the flavor of it. I mean, is that something you do where you, you know, Dexter, you think of Miami, Twilight, the Pacific Northwest. Do you, like, how much do you try to, you know, make the location a character in your stories? As much as possible, um, for sure. Uh, I went to Baltimore before I started writing mm. uh, because I'd never been, and I knew that we wanted to set it there. Uh, so I went and spent uh, some time there just to get a feel for the town. It really opened up and, and spent some time at the school right. uh, for performing arts. And, and it, it really opened up my world. I, I, uh, it, it takes it from being uh, characters and sort of it, it's, it, brings it, to, it brings specificity to, to the scenes. And it, it's what makes it alive is, is, you know, finding the special things about the uh, the town. I mean, recently the the thing I did for ABC is set in New York City, and um, initially I was, was thinking sort of small and setting rooms and in, in setting scenes in rooms and sort of generic places. And, and the network said, you know, this is a pilot. This is New York. Let's see New York. And I was like, duh. What am I thinking? And so I began to place things in certain areas of New York. And I spent some time there, so I know the city. And it, it really it's the difference between. Uh, it, it's really what brings it alive. It really is what it becomes a character in and of itself. So I'm, I feel very strongly about it. Yeah. Absolutely. A little Other hard questions? if you're doing Hello. a sci-fi movie. Hi, Melissa. <laughs> Sorry. See you. Hi. Thanks for coming here. And as you said, you went to Peter Stark program because as a producer or a director, you can have more control of your writings or stories. Can you give us an example where your experience of how you fight with producer or um, how you protect your working? Well, it hasn't, I mean, it's, it's, that hasn't come to play as much. It hasn't come to play yet in features, although it's beginning to. Uh, it has in, in television because in television we're a writer producers. And the writer is, uh, is the, the, the writers are the ones who are in control in television as opposed to in features where the directors are in control. So um, we have, more, so so the, the, my education at Stark gave, gave me a really great sense of um, what actually in a practical way it took to produce an hour of television. Um, but, you know, it's interesting. I, I, um, it's interesting. I haven't done as much producing. Uh, I've, done, I've done a great deal less producing than I have writing. And, and it's only just now, 20 years into my career, that I'm now given the opportunity to produce for the first time, really act as a producer, and in features is when that's happening, and actually, uh, you know, depending on what happens in television, um, and so I'm, I'm I'm entering a new. So I'm now going to be drawing on, you know, 20 years ago my my Stark uh, education, and uh, it's just gonna really uh, going to be interesting. So I, I can't really answer your question yet because I, you know, again, talk to me in a couple of years, and I'll tell you, uh, I'll tell you how how this how 
see how it works. <laughs> is your production company, it's up and running now, right? It's well, it oh. is. I, I have a, a production company called Tall Girls Productions, and um, for obvious reasons, but, uh, you know, uh, it's not limited to girls, and it's, uh, they don't have to be tall. It's a state of mind. And, and, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, my, the, what I want it to do is to uh, produce projects that uh, uh, are with strong roles for women. And so that's its goal. Now, I'm not talking about chick flicks. In fact, I don't like chick flicks. I'm talking about strong roles for women. I'm talking about the female Tony Soprano and the female Batman. And the fa I mean, these are, this is what I'm talking about. So I, I don't want anything from Nicholas Sparks. Or, you know, that's not what's happening for me. Uh, God bless him and, and all that's going on, but I, it's not my. But uh, in any event, um, yeah, so, and, you know, it's not, I don't have a deal set up anywhere. I don't have an office. Or, I just simply said, you know, I am now producing. So I am now Tall Girls Productions. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very much it's just, you know, uh, this is what it's going to be. So, uh, you know, eventually someone uh, I, I hopefully will give me some money and, and uh, I'll have an office and I'll hire somebody. And, <laughs> yeah. and then I'll get to hire more people. And, you know, so it's just at a certain point you just decide you're going to do something. You just do it. And again, talk to me in a few years. I might be like, you know, can I have a job? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, yes. my name is Brian. I'm part of the YouTube Creator Institute. Um, the reason I was very interested in applying to the YouTube in, uh, Institute is because I'm seeing more and more integration year by year. It's getting more and more rampant uh, with social in social media integration and traditional media. Even Dexter had the web series that mm -hmm. ran in parallel. And I was just wondering what your impression and what you saw in the future uh, from your standpoint about social media and integration with traditional TV and movies. Uh, you know, I'm, I apologize. I don't know a lot about it, to be honest with you. I know it's been um, it, it's very much a part of the Twilight phenomena, uh, huge in marketing, I mean, obviously. And, yeah, and, and uh, the web series in, in Dexter. But I, I don't uh, – what I know is that I will, again, hire people who know all about it and uh, keep me in the in – the, keep me current and, and keep, you know, that, that moving. So – that's uh, why we have young people. <laughs> <laughs> That's a cop out, but. Um, hi, my name is James, and I'm in the graduate screenwriting program here. So thanks a lot for coming. Oh, You're a big hero to a lot of the people in my oh, program. Thank you. That's lovely. Um, you mentioned that one of the skill sets that, as, as a successful TV writer, you need to have is being good at taking notes. And having been in a writing group for a long time, obviously you take notes all the time. Given your stature now, you probably don't have to take notes that oh. you don't want. <laughs> but I'm just wondering what the skill set is for dealing with notes that you sort of disagree with. Well, it's interesting. You don't have to take notes. Um, I guess I probably could, you know, throw a little tantrum and say, hey, my movie's made a billion. You know, and, and I know to not take notes, you have to be willing to say, I know what's best and what, I, and what I'm doing is right. And that's never the case in storytelling or in art, I think, in general. Well, maybe it is, but. Um, there's no finite right answer. So the process of having been made to take notes for so long has, has gotten me to the place where uh, I'm reliant on them. Uh, I, I count on them. I, um, you know, my hire assistants who uh, will, you know, give me feedback. I surround myself with writer friends who will be honest with me. And <coughs> it is essential to my growth. It's a, I, I've never, ever, ever handed anything in that hasn't been read by, like, ten people. Uh, it just never happened. I mean, except, you know, in television. But even in television, I have other fellow writers who are giving me notes and giving me feedback. So um, it's, it's, it's really crucial. And um, I think, those, I think when, when you get to the – when you find yourself in that place of, of, like, oh, my God, it's the shittiest note. I, I, I have to take these notes. I think part of what happens uh, in a resistance to notes is this: uh, is there's I think there's this sort of unconscious fear, or perhaps it's conscious, that I w you won't have a better idea. So that what you've done, you know, the scene you wrote works. You know, you know it works. It, the scene has a beginning, middle, and end, and it plays. And that someone would come along and say, "Well, it could be better," is it's like, but it works. If it works, so I, if, I, if I if I redo it, it, it won't work as well. It's like, you know, it probably will. It, it, can, it really probably will. It, it can eventually get better. I mean, maybe it's going to get worse first, and then it will get better. There is no sort of, you know, until it's actually filmed it on a screen and edited it in the, you know, in the can, it can, it can get better. 
and it's that and it's just a matter of having enough confidence in yourself and i think that's what's changed for me over the years is I, in, in, the, in the beginning of my career i was very resistant to notes i mean every note i was like this you could just you know and you get that with a lot of people who are you know like this you see their body language like this as they're getting you're getting notes and, and they're just see, i think that's i think they're terrified i know i was terrified i wouldn't have a better idea or that the scene I wrote that would work would suddenly would not work and it would just get worse. And I think that is something that I uh, finally can say uh, that I, uh, you know, have, have let go of. I still get terrified. I still like start, you know, well, in integrate all the notes and go, I've made it worse. But now I know that that's part of the process is to make it worse and then even better again. So if you find yourself doing this with notes, just try to, you know, <laughs> let it go. Because that, that is, I, I honest, honestly still continue on that. I think that one of the th reasons I got fired when I did uh, in the beginning of my career is that was one of the reasons, is because that was in, in some, that was my attitude uh, uh, in that kind of environment. And you can't have that attitude. No one wants to work with you if they can't, if they don't feel this, you know, the back and forth and the collaboration. So uh, I highly recommend the letting go of the stuff. Being fluid. Who's next? Do we have any more questions? We have some more from around the world. I can read a couple more. Um, okay, so this is uh, Daniel in Taipei who says, uh, I'm an American expat who dreams of returning to the States to become a Hollywood writer. How can writers and producers leverage platforms like YouTube to develop our careers, what are the advantages to YouTube for writers and producers? Oh my God! I don't think I, he works for YouTube. I, I I don't know if I I think that's I, I don't know if I can answer that other than to say, any opportunity to tell a story, is uh, and to put it out there that people see is, you know, that's everyone's way in and you know, again I don't know the the world well enough to comment. Talk a little bit about you know I'm curious as the you know you talked about getting notes and that with with the twilight films you know as it's gone on now has it gotten easier for you and obviously they you know they must the studio the filmmakers must feel like you know they know what they've got with you i mean has it been an easier process for you as it's gone on um it's easier well in some regards i mean uh, you know the studio certainly trusts me and and uh you know that uh, there's uh, but, it, you know, storytelling is always hard, no mm. matter what. And everybody has their opinions on what should, you know, what something needs to be. And, you're, you know, you always have to navigate that. And, um, you know, there's a, the, having, having a trust in, in, a, in a, a language that we speak now after five movies, you know, mm. there, that definitely helps with the, the process. But, you know, this, this last book also had a lot of uh, emotional uh, baggage attached to it uh, for uh, a lot of us going into it you know where the, the book was controversial and um, you know so there was a lot going into it that stirred up some stuff that that wasn't as uh, as big an issue in, in the first three books I mean in terms of like the, the the actors like I mean I can tell you from the my experience just now that once all of the actors were in place and and you know I was doing a production rewrite you know the the idea of who I was writing for made it a lot easier. I mean, did that mm. knowing the actors? I mean, did that help? Like in oh, terms yeah. of yeah, it helped a lot. I mean, the first movie I was writing in a vacuum, I had no idea what who, who these people were and you know who the actors were and, and what the tone was going to be. And I remember the first the first movie um, that it was I had a lot sort of broader humor. I, I tend to I mean you wouldn't can tell by looking at Twilight, but uh, I actually like to write with a sense of humor. And uh, so it it. You know, I had some some sort of broad humor in there, and it was completely inappropriate for the <laughs> movie. I mean, it just it's not that's not what Twilight is. It's not the movie. Um, so, and once you put it on those actors and you see the choices that they've made, you know, you begin to write toward that. And the choices they were making were uh, going much darker and and deeper than what I was. So I I, I followed them there. Hmm. Um, you know, talk about um, the idea now. Okay, Summit is the studio that's produced those movies. Right now, we, we w would you consider them like a mid-major, a mini-major? Are they, are they a full-on studio now? Well, they're a full-on studio. I, I think they're considered a, a mini-major or a, 
I mean, they're they're doing I don't know twelve movies a year or something. I, right? I guess my question is like in, in terms of where the industry is headed. You know, you have the big major studios and you have you know independent films. There's not a whole lot of middle ground, I would say, and and you know places like Summit, maybe Lionsgate, have sort of you know are in that ground. Do you see you know more of these kind of opportunities in between, let's say, like the major you know six, seven studios and the independents? Um, you know, the the kind of you know it's not a hundred million dollar blockbuster. It's not a you know three million dollar indie film. Like, mm. do you see more of those opportunities now? You know, I think the more Everybody would love to come up. I mean, you know, the Twilight movies were 40, 60, 70 million. Right. You know, I mean, those are and made, you know, over a billion. So it's you can't, you know, and I, I think something like Bridesmaid was, you know, these everybody wants to make that sort of mid level budget movie that is a, a blockbuster. So I think, uh, you know, um, Summit certainly is making those that budget movie. Um, I think everybody wants to make those. Uh, you know they're lower risk, and and I think you know you you can actually again, the storytelling you can actually tell a good story. You don't need two hundred million dollars to do it. You know. What do you what do you look for, and I mean, what do you see as as uh, you know, projects, movies, TV shows that you say um, you know I, I wish I'd written that. What mm. what do you watch when you go when you turn on your TV when you go to the movies? Well, I watched Bridesmaids, and uh, <laughs> I, I don't think I could write that, but I sure as hell admire the people who did um, uh, and the women who wrote it. Uh, uh, the movies I, I want to write are Iron Man and, uh, you know, uh, movies that, uh, X-Men, movies that are, um, uh, have a sense of humor. I, for, for, for movies, it's interesting, with movies and television, I have very different tastes. In, in movies, I, I like the big popcorn movies, the big commercial tent pole. I, I, as an as a audience member, that's what I would love to go see. I really appreciate the small independent movies, but I'm not going to be the one to write those um, and so, or, or produce those. Those are not sort of my cup of tea. I love that someone is, that the people who are doing them are. Uh, that just probably wouldn't be. So for me, uh, but, in, but in television, I lean much more toward the small, like the Dexter of it. Mm. The, the Dexter would be, you know, sort of the independent film of television, the, the Mad Men, the, you know, all of those. Um, so I, I tend to, so f in terms of what I want to do, I want to do some sort of dark, edgy, twisted television and big commercial, you know, mm. popular films. So it's sort of an, a schizophrenic sort of thing. So you've done, on the feature side now, you've done, you know, a few adaptations. like. Do you do you like ad adapting someone else's work? Do you do you want to go and you know do more uh, you know originals on your own? You know that was one of the things I discovered over the course of working on both Dexter and Twilight. You know I'd, because as I said, you know I've had a long career and a lot of ups and downs. And when it finally kind of came together, it was right with the Dexter Twilight of it. And I said, well, what do they have in common? They're both adaptations. They both are based on uh, previously previously written material. So I I really began to see that that's what I love to do, that's, I, I think I'm, you know, I'm good at it, or at least uh, I've, I've had some success at it. So uh, it was I interesting. I, I mentioned earlier about how I, I, was, I discovered as I went through a lot of writing uh, television experiences that I uh, should not choose a show that doesn't have a writing room because that's not my, that's not how I work. It's not how I love to work. That I would only work on shows that had a writing room. This was another discovery about what I do best and what I, uh, wh where I can shine um, if, if I'm going to shine where I can. And that's going to be in um, adapting other people's material. And a lot of that has to do, it's, all, it's actually kind of there's a continuum to it because for me, the adapting is, is the equivalent of working with, is collaborating with another writer. You're taking a world that another writer has, has created, or even, you know, in some cases, you're just taking characters or, uh, or general concepts, but you're, you're collaborating with another writer on the page. Uh, you may not even be in a room with all the, Stephanie and I were actually in a room a great deal together, but, you know, uh, for these other projects that I've done, uh, y you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily in a room bouncing ideas back and forth, but I am because I'm on the page. And that's, I just discovered for myself that that's what I, I do best. Um, I would love to be one of those people who, you know, the, Charlie Kaufman, mm -hmm. who is, is just extraordinary, uh, has extraordinary imagination and, you know, I, I, he's, he's the bar for me in terms of what a, an amazing, 
original writer is. I'm not Charlie Kaufman. That's not who I'm. I'm not going to write adaptation, though. I think it's one of the great films. You know, I'm not going to write being John Malkovich. Um, you know, I just had to accept who am I? What am I going to be good at? And and where can I best uh, fit? And this is where I best fit. Everyone will have to find that for themselves. It, and sadly, it took me a very long time to figure it out. I probably would have been successful a lot long, a lot sooner if I'd gotten it earlier, but I, I didn't. So I was fortunate that I had the opportunity now. We have time for a couple more questions. Right here in the front. Uh, so my question is, uh, thanks for coming out. I really enjoyed it. The, um, my question is, how do you manage expectations from readers, people who followed the book, and then you are going to you know, screen write the, the film? How do you kind of manage that expectation? Because a lot of times, you know, you get these crazy avid readers sure. who really expect the entire book and every detail from the book. How do you, how do, you do that as a screenwriter? Well, you, I, it's a very good question. You, you can't, obviously, um, because it, it, like with me when I was talking to you about the um, when a director, uh, when, when I see my work, realize I've seen the movie in my head and they can't possibly do it. Everyone who's read a, a book that I've adapted, they've seen the movie in their head. They've seen it all. And there's no way I can, certainly not when you've got millions of viewers. So, you know, I, I, the thing that, I, the way I approach it is I I, uh, my goal is to take the characters on the same emotional journey. It's not going to be the same dialogue. It's not going to be the same scenes. It may not even be some of the same characters. But if my characters can go on the same emotional journey that they did in the book, my hope is, is that the reader slash audience will have the same experience that they had reading the book. Um, you know, that you can go online right now and hear all the ways in which I failed. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think enough people have, have felt that, you know, it, it worked that they came and saw the film. Uh, but that's, you know, it was very, very tricky. And, you know, I, it was incredibly uh, uh, intense, the pressure, in terms, particularly when it came to the second film. The first film, I didn't know there was much of a fan base. The second film, I was like, oh, my God, you know, <laughs> this, you know, did I want to be the writer who crushed the, you know, destroyed <laughs> the favorite book of every teenager in the world. And so it was, you know, and, and you have to obviously put that out of your head. You can't, you can only just sit down with the book and and tell the story you want to tell and then worry about it, you know. But uh, it's, you know, there's a fair bit of pressure. Yes? Regarding the size of the final target project, did you kind of feel confident in tackling another project that big? Absolutely. Absolutely. That, you know, that's the other thing I discovered is I, Twilight, again, a, a continuing storyline. It's a, it's, a, it's a franchise, and it's what I've been doing for 20 years in television is telling, uh, uh, you know, serialized stories. Uh, and I realized that for me, uh, in movies, that's what's unsatisfying for me uh, as a storyteller in, in films is that you spend all this time coming up with two hours of a movie, and then it's over. Like, no, no, if your characters are interesting enough, I, you want to see them again and again. And so my hope, I, you know, I, I would want to create more and more franchises. Again, I'm not the writer who's going to come up with the, you know, really beautiful, the station agent or, you know, these are great, great movies. You know, they're, they're, they're standalone. Um, hat, my hat's off to them. I enjoy them as an audience. But I want, I want it the big commercial Continuing storyline franchise because that's what I love as a viewer. Good. As far as storytelling, do you think it would be amazing if every good story was an action scene? Uh, character, 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 character. Uh, you know, it's it starts with a, a rich, complex, flawed character, and it takes that character on a surprising journey, emotional journey. Uh, or that group of characters, and that's uh, that's the essential. That's, that's the essence of it to me, um, and that is to me also where I think some storytelling really falls off. Is it becomes about the action scene, or it becomes about the, the concept, the plot, and ignoring the the character, uh, or or that comes you know, sort of tacked on secondary. And um, I think you know there's no story with without it and. Story, character is story, is structure, is all of it. Do we have time for one more question? Yes, sir. Uh, going back to North Korea, uh, a 
that being the case, I think it's sort of expected at this point. But uh, what is your process like when you when you start getting further on in life? Is it starting a little bit more mm. from the support than it would be from where you just you, you know play a few chords? Sure. Play some chords? Well, let me first say that Dexter, the the pilot, was written by James Manos, so that was before I was on board. So um, he he really did an extraordinary job just starting with that. He used uh, you know he set the 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 path for our first season, the, the book, uh, book one of Dexter was the, the, our first season. But, you know, you have, the, you have the opposite problem with Dexter that you do with Twilight. With mm -hmm. Twilight, you know, you're condensing, and with Dexter, you're expanding for 12 hours. Mm -hmm. So you have characters in the book that are, 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 you know, not, that are very sort of peripheral. But in a television series in 12 hours, you know, you've got to, you can, you, you've got to fill in with, you know, these other characters. You've got to make them rich enough that they can carry storylines on their own or else you're going to have Michael C. Hall on set every single day of the week and he's going to be exhausted and, you know, not to mention just, you know, you need to fill it out and, and give it uh, texture and, and, um, and color. So it's, uh, that was, that's the... Uh, Primary. So we, you know, by the time we got to the end of the first season, we had already kind of really veer, veered from the first book because we were filling out with all these other different storylines. So we, there were some some things that were similar in in uh, Jeff's books that were for the television series, but they're kind of natural places for the character to go, like you know, marriage and family uh, and all that. Um, but we had already kind of gone on diverging paths, so we just kept following our our people. Thank you. Oh, well, we had a, an incredible staff. So. Yeah, any other uh, last words? Oh, this gentleman here. Oh, it's a little yeah. quick. Um, yeah, so the Twilight series has been a tremendous commercial success. I mean, we have huge fan base. Um, however, it hasn't always been the greatest critical success mm -hmm. when the trailer came out. And I, I was wondering, how do you deal with the negative, crit neg negative criticism in, you know, with the trailer coming out? I thank God I have Dexter. <laughs> I, I don't anymore. Actually, I, I'm no longer on Dexter. I had to I had to leave because of Breaking Dawn. But uh, that was a nice. Uh, no, uh, the, you know it's 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 tough because you know that is what we all go through. You know what you were talking about earlier, of how do you take the hits? And it starts when you just give your script to one person, and the hits start coming. And then when you get to something like Twilight, and you're taking the hits from millions of people, and from critics. Um, uh, you know, I have, I have to tell you, I have a really simple uh, answer, which is uh, my husband reads everything before I do. He, uh, you know, it's like you, you just don't subject yourself to it. I don't, you know, the movie is made. Um, if there's a, a really good point, uh, you know, he might l let me read it, but he approves everything because you can absolutely, you know, I can read 20 things, uh, you know, on uh, blogs are really, you just don't want to go anywhere near blogs. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I could read 20, 20 comments, and they're all like, oh, my God, you're the most amazing, you know, and, and you get that one person who's like, yeah, you should be eviscerated. And, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, and that's the one I listen to, and then I can't write for the rest of the day. You know, because that's, you know, we all have our inner demons, and when you're a writer, there's, there's, it's all quiet, and you, and you have nothing but you and your demons. And uh, the difference between a writer, a working writer, and, and, you know, the not is did you win the battle with those demons, you know? So um, I don't need any more, you know, those demons don't need any, any fuel. So I, you just, you know, I, I, I don't know how other writers do it, but um, you just, it's too much, you know, because you can, you can find negative things about yourself any time, any day of the week. Why go looking for them, you know, so. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Melissa for being with us this evening. Sure. Justin, thank you for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the second in our evening uh, performances, or I should, should I say interviews, and we look forward to having you join us again soon, so live from Room 108 in the School of Cinematic Arts. To all of you, thank you for joining us, and to all around the globe, thank you for tuning in. Good night. Thanks, everybody.